Unit 3, Applications of the Derivative. Here's an outline of what we're going to be looking at in Unit 3. As you can see, our focus is going to be on extrema and concavity for the first two lessons, which is really all about rates of change, and we're going to look at some further applications of rate of change in Lesson 3 and Lesson 4. As you can see, Unit 3 will be our first opportunity to see a two-day test. All of the uh, content in Unit 3 will be assessed on both dates, but the uh, first date will be a technology active or calculator active uh, test, where the second day will be non-calculator. So let's take a look at Lesson 3.1, Extrema and Concavity, a graphical approach. So let's take a moment to remind ourselves of the basics of how to read a graph. Here we're looking at the function f. As you can see, the function goes up, and then it peaks up here, goes down, we have a valley, and then it goes back up. So in the language of calculus, we would say that the function is increasing, and then we would say that the function is decreasing, and then the function is increasing again. Again, that's increasing from here to about here, decreasing along this interval, and then increasing along that interval. So, so we could say increasing from negative infinity until about negative one. We could say that it's decreasing from negative one to about two. And then we could say it's increasing again from two to infinity. But that's not really what the focus of this lesson is, so let's go ahead and get rid of that. Now these points where the function changes from increasing to decreasing, right here and right here, we're going to call those extreme. Where we specifically change from increasing to decreasing, we have a maximum. Where we change from decreasing to increasing, we have a minimum. So both are referred to as extrema. We have a relative max. We have a relative min. The relative max is where the function changes from increasing to decreasing. The relative min is where the function changes from decreasing to increasing. It goes down and then up. That's a relative min. It goes up and then down. That's a relative max. Now, where the function is increasing on this interval right here, where the function is increasing, what I'm really saying is that all of the slopes, everywhere I measure a slope, it's always pointing up until the point where we reach the relative maximum, where the slope is no longer positive. Function is increasing, the slope is positive. In the language of calculus, again, we say f prime is positive. f prime is positive means f is increasing. If the function is increasing, then f prime is positive. Likewise, where the function is decreasing, we have a negative slope, or the derivative is negative. And then, of course, f is increasing, we're back to f prime being positive. So what we have is this idea that where the relative maximum occurs, where the relative maximum occurs, we're changing from f is increasing to f is decreasing, or you could say f prime changes from positive to negative. A relative minimum is where f prime changes from negative to positive. Anywhere we change positive to negative or negative to positive, we have extrema. We could go further and say that at that relative maximum, because the derivative is changing from positive to negative, by the intermediate value theorem, if the derivative is changing from positive to negative, at that point, the derivative itself must be zero. Same thing at the relative minimum. When the derivative changes from negative to positive, the derivative must be zero. Now we can use all of this information to help us get a shape of that derivative graph. I know that the derivative is zero right here and zero right here. So if I were to draw a derivative graph right on top of this function graph, since the derivative is zero right here, I'll put a zero on the x-axis at negative one, I'll put a zero on the x-axis at positive two. I know that between these two points where the derivative is zero, the derivative is negative. So I'm gonna go connecting those two points down below the x-axis. And then, to the left of x equals negative 1, the derivative is positive. So I know the graph is going to go up in this direction. Same thing over here. So I get an idea of what the derivative graph looks like just by looking at the original function. Now, just like I did on this one, where I analyzed where the function is increasing, where the function is decreasing, and so on and so forth, I could do the same thing on the derivative graph. Notice that the derivative has a minimum right here. So I know the second derivative is going to equal zero at that point. I can see that the derivative is decreasing from negative infinity to that point. 
since the derivative is decreasing, I know that the second derivative is going to be negative. Versus over here, the derivative is increasing, so I know that the derivative, second derivative, is going to be positive. So I can get a shape for the second derivative based on the shape of the first derivative. Now, we're going to stop here because the original function, first derivative and second derivative, are typically the only ones that we have to focus on in a first and second year calculus class. Those are the ones that have the most applications. But we can see that there's a relationship that I conceive of the second derivative all the way back to the original function, where the second derivative equals zero, the first derivative has a minimum value, or more generically, an extreme value. It doesn't really matter whether it's a min or a max. Where the second derivative is equal to zero, the first derivative has extrema. And if I look at the original function, what we have is a point of inflection. Because to the left of that point, the function is concave down. To the right of that point, the function is concave up. So the original graph is concave down. When the derivative is decreasing and the second derivative is negative. So we have this connection right here between a function, its derivative, and its second derivative. A function is concave down when the derivative is decreasing and the second derivative is negative. Likewise, a function is concave up when the derivative is increasing and the second derivative is positive. Let's summarize that. When a function is concave up, its derivative is increasing, its second derivative is positive. Likewise, when a second derivative is negative, the first derivative would be decreasing, the function would be concave down. Well, as we already saw, where a function changes from increasing to decreasing, we call that a maximum. Notice that if the function is increasing or is changing from increasing to decreasing, the function has a maximum. The derivative will have a zero because the derivative is changing from positive to negative. The function has a maximum because the derivative changes from positive to negative. But I could just as easily say that the derivative has a maximum because the second derivative changes from positive to negative. This relationship between concave up, increasing, and positive, or concave down, decreasing, and negative, is true regardless of what tier of derivative that we're looking at. Any function and its derivative has this same relationship. So you can think of this on a sliding scale depending on what function you're looking at, what derivative you're looking at, what tier of function you're looking at, you can build this little chart to help you figure out what the relationship is between each function, its derivative, and its second derivative. Now, notice, keep in mind, when we change from concave up to concave down, we can call that a point of inflection. If I were to extend this chart a little bit further, we can see that when a uh, second derivative is negative, we already knew that it was concave down. When a second derivative is positive, we already knew the function was concave up. We have this decreasing to increasing, changing into a minimum. And here I always like to point out that we have a different word when a function changes from increasing to decreasing versus decreasing to increasing, max versus min. We do not have a change in vocabulary when we're talking about concave up to concave down versus concave down to concave up. It's a point of inflection in either direction. So let's summarize our summary. Here are the rules related to extrema. Extrema occurs at critical points or endpoints. Critical points are anywhere the derivative equals zero, or let's not forget, undefined. Uh, if I give you a graph that looks like this, this point right here is a relative max, but its derivative is undefined. Because this is a cusp we looked at in the last unit, that is one of the situations where a derivative is undefined. Just because the derivative is undefined does not mean that it's not uh, extrema. A derivative being undefined can still be extrema. Now, just because a derivative is undefined doesn't mean that it's extrema, because we have this situation as well, where the derivative is undefined. And there is no max. So remember, a critical point is not the same thing as an extreme value. 
A critical point is simply a place where an extreme value can occur. Extreme values can occur when the derivative equals zero, but extreme values can also occur when the derivative is undefined, cusps specifically. So when we're looking for extrema, we need to find all critical points, and that includes when the derivative is zero or undefined. Keep in mind also, if we're dealing with absolute extrema, endpoints are often going to be in play. Local extrema occurs when f changes from increasing to decreasing, that would be called a max, or decreasing to increasing, that would be a min. f prime changes sign. So when the function changes direction, the derivative changes sign. Throughout the course, I'm going to switch back and forth on this vocabulary. Local extrema, relative extrema. Same thing. Some people call it relative extrema, other people call it local extrema. I am very inconsistent in how consistent I am about which verb uh, vocabulary I use. Points of inflection can be thought of as the extrema of the first derivative. Keep in mind, anywhere a first derivative has a max, the original function has a point of inflection, first derivative has a min, original function has a point of inflection, so that means the second derivative could equal zero or undefined for the same reason that we said we had before. But just like before, where the derivative equals second derivative equals zero undefined does not automatically make it a point of inflection. It's simply a possible point of inflection. So possible point of inflection is similar to the critical point that we found before. Just because it's a critical point does not make it a point of inflection just because it's a point where the derivative second derivative equals zero, we still have to test it to make sure that it actually is a point of inflection. Point of inflections occur when the function changes concavity, or when f prime has a maximum or minimum, or let's go ahead and add one more point here, where the second derivative changes size. So the actual test for finding local extrema, also known as the first derivative test. Take your first derivative and find the critical points. The critical points when the derivative equals zero or undefined. Do a sign analysis or sign chart to determine where the derivative actually changes sign. You, again, you can do this on a chart or just by inspection of a graph. And then draw your conclusion. When it comes to AP Calculus, there's a stock phrase that we're going to be looking for when you are identifying the location of relative extreme values. X equals A is a maximum because F prime changes from positive to negative. Anything more than that statement is unnecessary. Anything less than that statement is insufficient. Where is the extreme value? It's on X equals A. What is it? It's either a max or a min. Y because f prime changes from positive to negative, or if it's a minimum, negative to positive. I don't need anything more than that. The only variation comes when we're looking for absolute extreme. Remember that absolute extrema is the highest point overall or the lowest point overall. Sometimes we'll call this the candidates test. We're gonna start off the same way because the absolute extrema may also be a relative extrema. So what we typically do is let's find the relative extrema first. But instead of doing a sign chart, what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate the function at each of those critical points and the endpoints. This appears why we call it the candidates test, because the candidates for where the absolute extrema could occur could only be the relative extreme values or the endpoints. And since absolute is just what's the largest value overall and what's the uh, lowest value overall, let's just look at the function values. When I say function value, I specifically mean the y value. So let's find the y values at each one of the candidates, at the critical points and at the endpoints. Whichever, lar whichever value is the largest output, that's your maximum value overall. Likewise, the smallest value is going to be your minimum value overall. Now, what we're going to do next is we're going to look through a collection of some released uh, FRQ questions from past exams. You can see this one goes all the way back to 1980. Now, that's a long time ago. But the beautiful thing about mathematics is whether you're doing a question today or 500 years ago, 
it's still the same answer to the same questions. Now, of course, the AP calculus exam has evolved over time. Back in 1980, they didn't allow you to use a calculator, hence the no calculator symbol. But this type of question still appears today. So we're going to go ahead and practice this one as well as a few others after this one. Why don't you go ahead and hit pause right now, try this question on your own, and then hit play when you're ready. All right, let's take a look. Notice that the given function is the derivative. Pay attention to that. The given function is the derivative, not the original graph of f. It's labeled up here, and it's stated right here. Let f be a function that has domain, the closed interval, negative 1 to 4, and range, the closed interval, negative 1 to 2. Let f of negative 1 equal negative 1, f of 0 is equal to 0, and f of 4 equals 1. Don't get confused. These are function values. That does not reflect what you see on the graph up here. Notice f of negative 1 equals negative 1. The function value would be somewhere around here. F of 0 equals 0 right here, and F of 4 equals 1 somewhere up here. Although I don't actually know whether this point is higher or lower because I'm given no information about the Y values on the derivative itself. Also, let F have the derivative function F prime that is continuous and that has the graph shown in the figure above. So a third time where it's just describing that this is the derivative. So if you make that mistake, you were given three opportunities to not make that mistake. Let's look at part F. Find all values of x for which f assumes a relative maximum. So as soon as I see that phrase, relative maximum, I'm thinking to myself, relative maximum, I need to figure out my critical points anywhere the derivative is equal to zero or undefined. Now, for the purposes of earning all available points on the AP calculus exam, one of the things that they may or may not be looking for is a phrase along these lines, that a relative max or a relative min occurs when the derivative equals zero or undefined. So my suggestion is when you see some phrase like that, relative max or relative min, go ahead and write that down. F prime equals zero or undefined. Now in this case, we were told that the derivative is continuous. So if we don't say undefined, that's perfectly fine. And um, we should probably be a little bit more formal, if this is the actual answer to a question, and simply just saying f prime, f prime of x using that proper notation. You'll often see me do something like this when I'm just making notes to myself, but if I'm going to be formal, I need to make sure that I say f prime, whatever the variable is, equals zero. So f prime of x equals zero is where my critical points are going to occur. Now, what I'll also do is I'll go ahead and list out my critical numbers or critical points. are at anywhere the derivative is equal to zero, which is right here, right here. And now right here, um, it doesn't look like it's equal to zero. I'm going to assume that it's not. Even if it was, it wouldn't matter because uh, there's nothing to the right of x equals four. Relative extrema must occur. Relative extrema must occur where there's a change in the derivative value. So it's a relative max is never going to occur at an endpoint anyway. So my only critical points are at 0 and 2. Keep in mind, to be a maximum, I need the derivative to change from positive to negative. So on this one, the derivative is positive to the left, positive to the right. There's no change in the derivative sign. So that means the function has no change in direction. So there is no relative extrema right here. But at x equals 2, we're negative to the right of x equals 2. We have a change in sign from positive to negative. Therefore, we have a relative max at x equals 2 because f prime changes from positive to negative. So there's my stock phrase that I'm looking for. Relative max at x equals 2 because f prime changes from positive to negative. Final answer. Next up, let's find all values of x, which f assumes its absolute minimum. Notice the change in vocabulary here. We're now looking for an absolute minimum. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off the same way. Where does the derivative equal 0? Well, we have critical numbers 
at x equals 0 and 2. We already know that from the previous problem. But instead of thinking about where the graph changes from positive to negative, because we're doing absolute extrema, we're going to do the candidates test. All right. The candidates, again, are all the places where the absolute extrema could occur. Well, the absolute extrema could occur at zero, it could occur at two, but it could also occur at the endpoints of the interval at negative one and four. So we're going to evaluate the function at zero, at two, at negative one, and at four. My absolute minimum has to be one of these four values. Because we're on a closed interval, we have something called the extreme value theorem. That says on any closed interval, there will be an absolute maximum and there will be an absolute minimum. If it's an open interval, you're, there's no guarantee of an absolute max or an absolute min. But because I have a closed interval, the extreme value theorem says that somewhere between negative 1 and 4, including the possibility of the endpoints negative 1 and positive 4, there will be extreme values. So the extreme values has to be one of these four candidates. So let's evaluate each one in turn. We can go back up here and use the information that we were given right here to help us evaluate. F of 0 is 0. F of 2 we are not explicitly given, so we'll come back to that. F of negative 1 is negative 1. F of 4 is positive 1. So now, F of 2 is the only value we're not explicitly given. But what we already know from the previous problem is that at 2, we have relative max. If we have a relative max, then we can be sure that it's not going to be an absolute max. So we can actually ignore f of 2 as one of our candidates right from the get-go. Also, we can use the fact that the derivative is positive between 0 and 2. Since f prime is positive on the interval 0 to 2, we can say that f of 2 is going to be greater than f of 0. All right. Since f of 2 is greater than f of 0, and f of 0 is 0, I know that f of 2 is not going to be my minimum because f of 2 is going to be a number that's larger than 0. So two different reasonings I can use to eliminate f of 2. So now, final answer, where is the absolute minimum? The absolute minimum occurs when f of negative 1 equals negative 1. Now, we need to always be careful how the question is frame, framed. Find all values of x where the absolute minimum occurs. So I'm going to rephrase the answer as absolute min occurs at x equals negative 1. Other common ways that absolute extrema questions can be asked is what is the absolute minimum or what is the absolute maximum value? If the question is what is the value that I'm looking for the y value versus where or when does the value occur, I'm looking for the x value. Key is, look at the question before you answer the question. Make sure you're answering the question that was asked. Now, let's talk about that justification. On the previous question, the justification is this phrase right here, because f prime changes from positive to negative. For relative extrema, the justification is because f prime changes from blah to blah. For absolute extrema, the justification is this piece right here, the candidates test. The justification is each of the critical values and the endpoints were tested, and the minimum value was this. That is my justification. I don't need to say anything other than showing the work that supports my conclusion. Part C. Find the intervals on which f is concave down. Now, where is f concave down? Keep in mind we made that chart earlier, which can be helpful here, that when a function is concave down, right below it, its derivative would be decreasing, its second derivative would be negative. I want to know where f is concave down. That would mean that f prime is decreasing, 
and f double prime is negative. So f is concave down when f prime is decreasing. Since this is the graph of f prime, I just need to know where is f prime decreasing. Well, f prime is decreasing from negative 1 to 0, and it's also decreasing from 1 to 3. Now, notice this question doesn't ask for justification, so I just need to state the intervals. So find the intervals where f is concave down, f is concave down on, what did we just say? We said negative 1 to 0, union, 1 to 3. There's often debate as to whether we should use parentheses or brackets on increasing, decreasing, and concave up, concave down intervals. Uh, you know, in lower levels of math, the debate is settled. Uh, the, you know, x plus 1 equals 5. There's no debate that x equals 4. Uh, it's when we get into younger math subjects, like calculus, which is only a few hundred years old. Algebra is over a thousand years old. Uh, that some of the notational uh, choices are just that, they're choices. Uh, depends on how you define what it means to be increasing, what it means to be decreasing, and concavity uh, along the same lines. Uh, AP Calculus has the stance that uh, they don't care whether you use parentheses or brackets here. I have the stance that, well, you're not concave up or concave down, increasing or decreasing at a single point. You have to have an interval of points to be increasing or decreasing or concave up or concave down. So I will exclusively use parentheses when I'm talking about intervals of increasing, decreasing, or intervals of concave up and concave down. Again, because you're concave down between negative one and zero, not at negative one nor at zero. Domain and range is a different question. So I'll use brackets versus parentheses to signify a difference. But for increasing, decreasing, concave up, concave down, be aware I'm always exclusively 100% of the time going to use parentheses on those types of intervals. And part B, give all values of x for which f has a point of inflection. Well, a point of inflection is where we have a change in concavity. We have a change in concavity where the function changes concavity the derivative will change from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. So anywhere we change, the derivative changes from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing, we're going to have a point of inflection. So let's look at the derivative. Notice that we have a change from decreasing to increasing. So right there, we're going to have a point of inflection. Uh, and then right here, we have a change from increasing to decreasing. We're going to have a point of inflection. And then right here, we have a change from decreasing to increasing. We're going to have a point of inflection. So anywhere the derivative has extrema, the original function will have a point of inflection. So the question was, give all values of x for which f has a point of inflection. So one, two, three answers at x equals zero, one, and three. x equals zero, one, and three. Final answer. All right, let's try that again. Pause here, hit play when you're ready. Similar question. The figure above shows the graph of f prime, the derivative of the function f, the domain of f, uh, or the domain is the sum of all real numbers of numbers x such that uh, x is between negative 10 and positive 10. So we've got, uh, again, the graph of the derivative is given. This is the graph of the derivative. Uh, the last question, we had a restricted domain. Uh, this one, we also have a restricted domain from negative 10 to positive 10. Let's look at part A. For what values of x does the graph of f have a horizontal tangent? So a horizontal tangent a horizontal tangent. Tangent is referring to the derivative, and if it's horizontal, that means the slope is zero. So horizontal tangent, slope equals zero. Notice I'm not looking for maximums and minimums, so I'm not looking for critical points. I'm simply looking for horizontal tangents, which is only when the derivative is equal to zero. We do not need to consider when the derivative is undefined for a horizontal tangent. The derivative is undefined would be a vertical tangent. 
Horizontal tangent is only when the derivative equals zero. For what values of x does the function have a horizontal tangent anywhere the derivative equals zero? So at those four points, the derivative equals zero. x equals zero, or the, let's uh, phrase this appropriately, we have a horizontal tangent at x equals negative seven, negative one, four, and eight. Part B, for what values of x on the interval negative 10 to 10 does f have a relative maximum? Justify your answer. Notice the change to the open interval right here, because relative extrema can only occur where there's a change from positive negative to or negative to positive. So you can never have relative uh, extrema at an endpoint. So they just explicitly uh, put it as an open interval. So we're excluding negative 10 and positive 10 as possibilities. But now that we have the phrase relative maximum, I need to consider critical points. Now, of course, because this derivative doesn't have any points from negative 10 to 10 where it's undefined, we can ignore that. So we're looking at the same values that we did on the previous question, negative seven, negative one, four, and eight as my critical numbers. Let's label them as such. One of the key things we need to be careful with in calculus is labeling. We got a lot of things going on all at once. I don't know what you're talking about unless you tell me what you're talking about. If I just did this and said x equals negative 7, negative 1, 4, and 8, is that the answer to the question or is that just scratch work that you're doing in your head? I don't know unless you tell me, oh, these are just the critical numbers. So don't interpret this as the answer to the question. So critical numbers at those values. We want a relative maximum. A maximum is where the derivative changes from positive to negative. So if I look at the graph, I can see that we're going to change from positive to negative right here and right here. So I have two locations that represent relative maximums. So let's respond. Relative max at x equals negative 1 and positive 8 because f prime changes from positive to negative. Final answer. Part C, for, uh, for, value, for value of x, for what value of x is the graph of f concave down? f is concave down when f prime is decreasing. So decreasing on this interval and this interval. So that's going to be from negative 3 to 2. Union. That looks like it's going to go from 6 to 10. Final answer. All right, let's try another question. Notice that the part C on this question actually asks you to sketch a graph. Uh, all the way back in 1984, keep in mind we did not have graphing technology readily available as we do today. So they used to actually ask you to graph functions on the AP Calculus exam. This is no longer a required skill on the AP Calculus exam, but it is helpful uh, to understand the process of graphing so that when you graph something, uh, using technology, you know when what's on your calculator is or is not reasonable. So I'm going to go leave this on here for you to practice, although on the actual AP exam, this will never show up. Go ahead and pause here. Hit play when you're ready. All right, a function f is continuous on the closed interval negative 3 to 3, such that f of 3 is equal to 4 and f of 3 is equal to 1. The functions f prime and f double prime have the properties given in the table below. So instead of being given a graph, we're given a table of values. Uh, we know about the derivative and we know about the second derivative. These are the intervals on which the functions, uh, derivatives and second derivative are positive and negative, where it's 0, where it fails to exist. 
So let's look at the first question. What are the x coordinates of all absolute maximum and absolute minimum points on the closed interval negative 3 to 3? Justify your answer. So I'm looking for absolute, so I'm thinking candidates tests. Well, the candidates would be all of the critical numbers as well as the endpoints. Now, as far as critical numbers, critical numbers are any time the derivative is equal to 0 or undefined. The derivative is equal to 0 and it's equal, it's undefined at negative 1 and positive 1. But because we're also looking for uh, absolute extrema, we need to include the endpoints of negative 3 and positive 3. So I'm going to do my candidates test using all four values. All right. Now, keep in mind up here, we had some given information that f of negative 3 is equal to 4. We're told that f of 3 is, oh, there we go, f of negative 3 is equal to 4, f of 3 is equal to 1. Uh, we do not have the actual function values at negative 1 and positive 1, but we do know that between negative 3 and negative 1, the derivative is positive. So that means the function is increasing on that interval. So if the function is increasing, then that means that f of negative 1 is going to be larger than f of negative 3. So I know since the function value at negative 1 is larger than f of negative 3, f of negative 3 is 4, so I'm just going to write it like this. So f of negative 1 is greater than 4. I know that to be true. Uh, we can use a similar reasoning at f of 1. So f of 1, I could look at this interval right here, or I could look at this interval right here. Since I know what f of 3 is, I'm going to look at this interval right here. The derivative is negative, so the function is decreasing. So if the function is decreasing, that means f of 1 would be larger than f of 3. If the function is decreasing, I'm going to be larger on the left side than I am on the right side. So if x equals 1 versus x equals 3, uh, f of 1 is going to be higher than f of 3. f of 3 was equal to 1. So I know this is equal to 1. All right. So now let's address the question. Absolute max, absolute min. I'm going to start with the absolute min. Uh, I know that this y value is 4. This y value is smaller than 4. This is greater than 4. And this one is greater than 1. So this must be my absolute min. For the absolute max, 4 is the largest number I see, but this one is 4. This one is greater than 4. So this must be my absolute max. Now I will point out right here, f of 1 is greater than 1. Theoretically, that statement, that value still could still be larger than 4, but I also have this extra piece of information right here, that between negative 1 and positive 1, f prime is negative. Therefore, f is decreasing. So just like I had earlier, I could say that f of 1 is going to be less than f of negative 1. f of negative 1 was 4. So I know f of 1 is greater than 1, but I also know that it's less than 4. So I had that extra piece of information hiding right there. So I can be confident that uh, f of negative 1 is going to be my absolute max. So let's answer the question. What are the x coordinates of each? So let's respond to the question. The absolute max is at x equals negative 1. The absolute min is at x equals 3. Justification is all the work that I should have. Part B, what are the x coordinates of all points of inflection on the closed interval negative 3 to 3? So a point of inflection occurs where the uh, f changes inflection, but f prime has extrema, or f double prime 
changes size. All right, so I know that there's going to be a point of inflection anywhere F prime has extrema or F double prime change of sign. Keep in mind that my critical points, quote unquote critical points, my possible points of inflection can occur when the second derivative equals zero or when it fails to exist. But the key is I have to have a change in sign. So the second derivative is positive, stays positive, and then becomes negative. Therefore, the only place where the, the second derivative changes sign is at x equals 1. So what are the x-coordinates of all points of inflection? Points of inflection at x equals 1. I need a justification because f double prime changes sign. All right, let's wrap this up with part C again. This question will not appear on your AP exam. If you want to skip this part, you are welcome to, uh, but I encourage you to try it on your own. Based on what we know, uh, I know that we have a point of inflection at x equals, where was it? It was at x equals 1. We have a point of inflection. We have... Uh, Absolute max at negative one. Let's just copy and paste that. Copy. Paste. All right, let's also keep in mind that we have some function values that are given, specifically f of three f of negative 3 equals positive 4, so I know that is a precise location. f of 3 is positive 1, that is a precise location. Uh, generally, uh, on the AP exam, they're not going to give you grid paper that the graph doesn't fit into, so I know the graph has to fit into this region. We have a point of inflection at negative 1, and then we have an absolute max at negative 1, we have an absolute min at, uh, at x equals 3. I know from negative 3 to 1, the graph is increasing. So from negative 3 to negative 1, the graph is going to be increasing. At negative 1, the derivative is going to fail to exist. And then from negative 1 to 1, the graph is going to be decreasing. And then it's going to continue to de decrease after 3. We're going to level off at x equals 1 when we uh, reach our point of inflection, but it's also going to have a zero slope. But it's not going to be an, uh, an extreme value because it goes from decreasing to decreasing. Now, the only thing I need to pay attention to is right here at x equals negative 1. The derivative fails to exist. There are three situations where a derivative could fail to exist. The derivative or the function could have a discontinuity, the function could have a cusp, or the function could have a vertical tangent. We can already eliminate discontinuity because it says right here the function is continuous. So we don't have a hole, we don't have an asymptote, uh, the, the function is continuous. So that means that the original function either has a cusp or a vertical tangent. Now, if it was a vertical tangent, then that means the other side would still be positive. The only way a vertical tangent occurs would be something like this, where the graph continues in the same direction whether it be increasing or decreasing on both sides of the point where the vertical tangent occurs. So because I change from positive to negative, that means negative 1, it must be a cusp. I don't know how high the graph goes, because at negative 1, the only thing I know is that the y value is greater than 4. So I'm just going to arbitrarily guess. So here's my cusp. And then I'm going to start to decrease until I get to x equals 1, where the graph is going to be 0, or the slope is going to be 0. And then it's going to continue to decrease after that until I reach my minimum value. So any graph that hits those uh, specific values or those specific behaviors would be accepted as a correct answer. Notice I can also say f double prime on negative 3 to negative 1, f double prime is uh, positive, so it's concave up. Here it's still concave up, and then it's concave down over here. So uh, although your graph could vary, 
um, from what I have right here, really the only variation would be how high this point would go uh, and where this, the height of this uh, um, zero slope could occur. Let's go ahead and pause here, hit play when you're ready. All right, let f be the function that is even and continuous on the closed interval negative 3 to 3. The function f and its derivatives have the properties indicated in the table below. Recall that a function being even has to do with symmetry. Even is y-axis symmetry. So consider the graph of y equals x squared versus the graph of y equals x cubed. Y equals X squared looks something like this. Y equals X cubed looks something like this. Here we have Y axis symmetry. Y axis symmetry. If we have Y axis symmetry, we say that the function is even. We get the word even from the fact that the power is even. Uh, keep in mind that it doesn't require a, a power uh, being an even number to be an even function. That's just where we get the name even. The cosine function is also an even function because it has y-axis symmetry. Over here, we have an odd function because the graph is symmetric about the origin. If I rotate it, rotate the graph around the origin, I get the exact same graph uh, after 180 degree rotation. Even functions on the y-axis symmetry, odd functions are symmetric about the origin. More algebraically, we can say that an even function is defined like this. So for an input value of negative x or positive x, we get the same output value. Whether I plug in negative x or positive x, I get the same output value. Versus for odd functions, we get opposite output values. If I plug in negative x over here versus if I plug in positive x over here, the outputs are opposite each other. So if I have an odd function, the y values are opposites. If I have even functions, the y values are the same. Back to the question. So we have our table of values. Let's look at part A. Find the x-coordinate of each point at which f attains an absolute maximum value or an absolute minimum value. For each x-coordinate you give, state whether f attains an absolute max or an absolute min. So still in the absolute min, absolute max. And again, we're using a table. So if I'm looking where we have an absolute max or an absolute minimum, I'm thinking candidates test. Candidates test is going to be based on critical numbers. Critical numbers are where the derivative is zero or undefined. So the derivative is undefined at zero. The derivative is zero at one. At two, it's also undefined. But keep in mind, we said that the function was even, so there's actually, this only goes from zero to three, our interval goes from negative three to three. So what I can actually do is I can extend this table. So we have f, f prime, f double prime. I know I've got zero in the middle. I've got one, I've got two. I'm going to go ahead and cap this at three. So this will be negative three. So this will be negative one, negative two. I know the function between zero and one is positive. I know the function between one and two is negative. I know the function between two and three is negative. Now, because the function is even, I know that we're going to mirror image on the other side. So this would also be positive. This would also be negative. This would also be negative. Now, for the derivative, we need to be a little bit more careful. 
notice is that if it's a mirror image, if we were increasing on this side, that means we would be decreasing on the other side. So where we know that F prime was negative, so from zero to one, F prime is negative. Uh, from one to two, F prime is negative. From two to three, F prime is positive. Because again, it's a mirror image, the function values will be the same, but the slopes will be inverted. So this will be positive, this will be positive, this will be negative. If the graph was increasing over here, the mirror image would be decreasing. Now, because we're just talking about absolute max and absolute mins, I'm not going to bother filling in the chart for the second derivative until I absolutely have to. So we know that I need to consider all these possibilities, 0, 1, 2. But also negative 1 and negative 2, f of negative 3, f of positive 3. Keep in mind that the function is continuous, so I don't have any discontinuities. Uh, so like we're here where I have derivative is undefined, derivative is undefined. The function exists. Those are either going to be a cusp or a vertical tangent. This could either be a cusp or vertical tangent. So I know certain function values, f of 0 equals 1. I know that f of 1 equals 0. I know that f of 2 equals negative 1. Now, again, because this function is even, I know that if f of 1 equals 0, then f of negative 1 also equals 0. If f of 2 equals negative 1, then f of negative 2 also equals negative 1. The only unknowns are at negative 3 and positive 3. So let's look at what's happening on the graph. If f prime is positive, that means the function is increasing from 2 to 3. So I know f of 3, I know f of 3 is going to be greater than f of 2. f of 2 was negative 1, so I know it's going to be greater than negative 1. And f of negative 3, f prime is negative, so it's going to be decreasing. So f of negative 3 is going to be greater than f of negative 2, so it's going to be greater than negative 1, which of course has to be true because of the mirror image. Question is about absolute max and absolute min. So let's start with my minimum value. So here's a possible minimum. Oh, no, negative one. Uh, this is greater than negative one. This is greater than negative one. So my minimum value is negative one. The question was find the x coordinate of each point at which f attains an absolute max or min for each x coordinate state whether f attains. So we're looking for the x value. So absolute minimum, I can spell, occur at x equals 2 and negative 2. And then for the absolute maximum, so I have a 1, boop, all these. So these are, say, greater than negative 1. So this is where it looks like my maximum occurs. But I have to exclude negative and positive 3. So what I know is that f of 0, it's 1. And then the function decreases and then decreases some more, and then increases, decreases, decreases, and then increases. But it's increasing at a decreasing rate. So because I have decreasing, it's decreasing over a larger interval 
then we're increasing. And at that, we're increasing at a decreasing rate. So I'm comfortable saying that the absolute max occurs at x equals zero. Part B, find the x coordinate of the point of inflection, justify your answer. So point of inflection occurs when the second derivative equals zero or is undefined, or the possible point of inflection occurs at zero or undefined. So we have undefined, we have zero, we have undefined, but that's not sufficient. We have to have a change in direction. So notice here, we go from negative to negative. So there's no change in direction or uh, uh, no change in inflection. So there's no change in inflection. So that is not a point of inflection. Uh, at zero, we do have a change from positive to negative. So I'm gonna go ahead and lock that in. We have a point of inflection at x equals zero. I need a justification because f double prime changes sign. I could say that it changes from positive to negative, but it's not necessary for a point of inflection because I don't care whether uh, the change is from positive to negative or negative to positive for a point of inflection. Uh, it's just that it changes that you have a point of inflection. Now we still have the possibility, oh, let's correct that. That should have been x equals one for that point of inflection. So we still need to consider at x equals zero. I know that we have undefined, but I need to know what's happening with the second derivative to the left of x equals zero, not just to the right. If I go back to this chart for just a quick second. So the second derivative at zero, this is the only value I'm concerned with. The second derivative uh, from zero to one was positive. I wanna know what's happening between negative one and zero. Well, we still know that the function is even. Well, if I have an even function, and I'm concave up on one side, I'm also going to have to be concave up on the other side. No matter how that occurs, if I'm concave up over here, even function is y-axis symmetry, I'm going to have to be concave up over there. So there's never going to be any point of inflection at that point that acts as the axis of symmetry. So because of that, we can be sure that there's only one point of inflection at x equals 1. All right, let's try it again. Pause here, hit play when you're ready. Figure above shows the graph of x prime. The domain of the is the set of all real numbers from negative three to five. For what values of f, uh, for what values of x does f have a relative maximum? At this point, we should be pretty good about identifying relative maximums. Recall that a relative maximum occurs when the derivative is equal to zero or undefined. This function is continuous from negative three to five, so we don't have to worry about uh, undefined. Uh, so critical numbers are at x equals negative two, one, and four. Negative two, one, and four. The maximum will occur when the derivative changes from positive to negative. So the only place that happens is at negative two. So a relative maximum at x equals negative two. Why? Because f prime changes from positive to negative. Remember that for relative max and relative min, I need the direction of the change in order to justify maximum versus minimum. Points of inflection, it doesn't matter what direction. Part B, for what values of x does f have a relative minimum? So basically, we're going to take that same information that we did here. I don't need to restate on the AP exam. Once you've stated something once, you don't have to state it again. All this information is already in play. So relative minimum would occur where we have a change from negative to positive. So let's answer the question. Relative minimum at x equals 4 because f prime changes from negative to positive. Part C. On what intervals is the graph concave up? Use f prime to justify your answer. 
So F is concave up. Remember that F is concave up when F prime is increasing, F double prime is positive. The question specifically says use F prime to justify your answer. So let's do that. F prime is increasing from here to here, from here to here. So let's answer the question. F is concave up on negative one to one, union three to five, Justify because F prime is increasing. All right, one last question to look at just so that we can say that we did. Uh, this is technically the same question, but instead of me giving you a graph, I'm gonna give you a function that you can use and graph it your, yourself using a graphing calculator. So if you don't have it handy right now, go ahead and pull out a graphing calculator, type this function in for y equals. Notice that we have a restricted domain from negative 0.5 to 1.5. I wanna know where the function g is both increasing and concave down. I'll go, uh, go ahead and pause the video here, hit play when you're ready. Let's take a look at a calculator. So here you can see I have already graphed the function cosine pi x squared into my calculator. Uh, the window I'm using is from negative 0.5 to 1.5 on the x-axis. For the y-axis, uh, you just have to guess and check a little bit to figure out an appropriate window for y. Technically, it doesn't matter, but I like to see a nice pretty graph that fills most of the screen. So I used negative 2 to positive 2 to get a graph that looks like this. Once again, the question was, where is the graph of G both increasing and concave down? Well, G is gonna be increasing when G prime is positive, and G is gonna be concave down when G prime is decreasing. So our knowledge of the relationship between G, G prime, and G double prime is gonna help us answer this question. G is increasing when the slope is positive. G is concave down when the second derivative is negative. And if the second derivative is negative, that means the first derivative is decreasing. So this is what I'm looking for. G prime is positive and decreasing. So let's look at the graph. It needs to be positive. So I don't care about any of this down here. It needs to be positive and decreasing. So uh, somewhere in this vicinity, there is a maximum. It looks like it's at zero, but we're gonna test it to make sure. So from this interval right here, so I need to figure out where is the maximum. I need to figure out where this x-intercept is right here. Uh, and then I have another maximum right here where it's gonna decrease until the upper bound, which I have forgotten what that upper bound was. It was 1.5. So 1.5 is definitely the upper bound. So I know my answer is gonna be something to something, union, something, no, not this something, this something, to 1.5. So I just need to figure out where those two maximums occur and where that x-intercept occurs. So on the 84 series, I'm gonna do second calc. I'm looking for a maximum, which is option four. This first maximum occurs somewhere around zero. So I'm just gonna test negative 0.1 as my left bound and 0.1 as my right bound. Yes, maximum is at x equals negative 7.815 e negative five. Now again, for those who have experience with the 84s, uh, this can sometimes happen. This just means scientific notation. So 10 to the negative fifth. So this is essentially zero. This is surrounding error by the calculator. So yes, maximum occurs at x equals zero. And then this x-intercept, second calc, x-intercept occurs somewhere between 0.5 on the left and one on the right. So it's gonna be 0 0.707, 0 0.707. And then I need to know where this maximum occurs, second calc, maximum 
somewhere between, well, it's going to be somewhere between 1 and 1.5. Converse of confidence on that, I guess. So 1.414. 1.414. Four. So there's my answer. Let's go ahead and write it down. So what was it? It was zero to 0 0.707 union 1.414 to 1.5. Final answer.